Hey everyone, Steven here, and today I'm reviewing the KTC G27P6. I recently reviewed the M27T20 that they have, which had solid performance and a great price. So I wanted to explore their lineup more. And this OLED monitor for the price beats a lot of other monitors with the same specs. If you tuned into CES this year, you know 2024 is the year of OLED monitors and all the ones coming out have incredible specs, but they also have an insanely high price tag. So for those that have been on the fence about getting an OLED due to the price, this might be one to consider. This is normally $7.99 on Amazon, which is already cheaper than a lot of other OLEDs. But this also has a discount code right now, and usually it has a discount code and that can range from $100 or more. But currently, as of the writing of this review, there is a $170 off coupon that you can use right now, and that brings this to somewhere in the range of $600, which is insane compared to the $1,000 plus price tags OLEDs normally have. Now, I covered KTC's history in my review of the M27T20, but for a quick recap, the full name is Key to Combat, and they're part of a much larger brand called STC, which has been making OEM panels for companies like Samsung and ViewSonic for a long time. During COVID, they decided to branch out with their own panels, and now we have their more affordable lineup with some top-notch specs. What's interesting about the G27P6 though is they advertise this as an LG OLED panel though. So although they've had this history of making these OEM panels for other companies, they actually went with an LG panel for this monitor, which now brings us to the G27P6 specs. So this is a 27 inch OLED 1440p monitor with a 240 hertz refresh rate and a 0.03 millisecond response time. Now the next handful of specs have been all mixed up depending on the listing. They're just different based off where I'm looking. This is a common issue among all monitor companies and honestly it drives me crazy because I have to clarify these things and reach out to the company just to find out what's going on. So here I'm going to be looking at what their main website says, what the spec sheet off of the Amazon listing says, and then I'll also be looking at displayspecifications.com and what they say about this monitor. I do want to note that I also reached out to KTC. I emailed them to get some of these questions answered because some of these I just couldn't even find. Like for instance, what the peak HDR is here and then what that window would be. So is this HDR 1000 and a 2% window? They don't have that information. So if I do hear back, I'm going to put that in the description of this video. I have not heard back yet, unfortunately, as of the writing and recording here, which is why I don't have it. So this has a typical brightness of 450 nits on the Amazon spec sheet, while the KTC website says that this has 300 nits. No mention of HDR 400 or higher here, although it will hit at least that based off of the Amazon spec sheet, but it's not certified through a company like VESA. Display specification says the SDR brightness is 135 nits, while peak brightness here is 700 nits. My guess is they skipped the certification here for monetary reasons and because this is an LG panel. No mention of the peak brightness, like I mentioned, or the screen percentage. But again, my guess here, if it is going to hit those higher nits, it's going to be in at least a 2% or lower window. For contrast ratio, this lists 135,000 for SDR and 1.5 million for HDR. There's a typo on the Amazon spec list where it says that it's 150,000, but considering this is an OLED, the 1.5 million is more standard. And essentially with this, you're gonna find that you have infinite black levels with an OLED since each pixel is backlit and that's the thing that usually people want, right? You want the really, really high contrast and the vibrant colors. This is true 10-bit color here for HDR, so no 8-bit plus FRC. This does have display stream compression, so in order to get 10-bit at 1440p, 240 hertz over DP, you will need to enable that. Otherwise, you're gonna be capped at 200 hertz with 10-bit color, 1440p, HDR. 
Now, if you do use DSC, I don't think visually you're going to be able to tell a difference between the two modes, whether or not that's enabled or not, if you want to use that so you can get the higher 240 hertz. But just keep in mind, unless you have a 4090, for most AAA games, you're not even going to get close to the 240 hertz, just depending on your settings. That is dependent upon the game and the settings here, and of course the GPU. But again, just keep those things in mind. It's not that big of a deal if you need to enable that because visually I don't think you're gonna be able to tell the difference. For colors, their website says that this covers 136% of the sRGB color gamut and 106% of the DCI P3. The Amazon listing spec sheet says 100% of the sRGB, 97% of the DCI P3, and 96% of the NTSC. Display specification says 100% of the sRGB, 92% of the Adobe RGB, and 97% of the DCI P3. My Spider X color calibration tool can't be used with OLEDs, unfortunately, so I couldn't test this myself. My guess here, though, is that the higher sRGB is most likely in regards to 10-bit color, but they just didn't specify that. Luckily, that is all the information that seems to be all over the place. So from here on out, this just kind of seems like everything was on the same page in regards to this information. So this does have FreeSync Premium Pro and is NVIDIA G-Sync compatible, which I've actually had on for all of the footage in this review. For ports, this has one DP 1.4, two HDMI 2.0, two USB 3.0 expansion ports, a USB Type-C port that has 90 watt power and can be used as a display input. And last, you have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. This comes with a KVM switch, so those ports can be used to connect peripherals that will then work with any device that is plugged into the monitor. This has two 5 watt speakers that I'll do a sound test for in a little bit. And then for physical adjustments, this has a height adjustment of 110 millimeters. This can swivel to the left and right 15 degrees. It can tilt forward 5 degrees and back 15 to 20 degrees. Last, this can pivot 90 degrees to the left or the right. Inside of the box, you're going to get the monitor, the stand, an HDMI 2.0 cable, a DP 1.4 cable, a USB type C cable. Then you're going to get the VESA risers here. So this does have a 75 millimeter by 75 millimeter pattern. If you want to VESA mount this, you get the user manual and then you get two calibration sheets that let you know based on the color space. So sRGB or DCI P3, what their color calibration results were in the factory. And both of these show a Delta E of less than two. Last, I don't see any warranty on any of the information that came with the monitor. I don't see a warranty listed on their website, but looking at the other OLEDs that they have in their warranty kind of lineup list, they do show that those come with a 12 month warranty on the panel. So my assumption here is that this also comes with a 12 month warranty on the panel for OLED burn-in but it also being missing, I'm a little bit concerned that it doesn't have a warranty at all. I have reached out to the company, still haven't heard back on that. I will put that in the description once I do hear back. Next, let's do a quick sound test of the speakers with the camera roughly three to four feet away from the monitor, and the audio levels are gonna be adjusted in post to bring this close to what it sounds like in person. So as you can hear, the speakers here get incredibly loud. I had to actually turn this down quite a bit in post to just mimic the sound because it was so overpowering based off the sitting distance away from the microphone. But here it has a good amount of bass to it. It has a rich sound. It doesn't sound flat. It gets incredibly loud, like I mentioned. And I want to say outside of the ROG 42 inch OLED that has a subwoofer built into it, this is probably one of the best speakers 
without a subwoofer, just speakers that I've used with a monitor. These are top notch here. So now let's get into the panel settings and the menu button here is a single button towards the right of the middle of the panel towards the bottom. And like I've said in almost all of my monitor reviews, I like the single button over multiple as they just seem easier to use. Now I won't cover every single setting here, but starting with the display tab, you have brightness, contrast, black equalizer, preset, aspect ratio, sharpness, and display position. For presets, you have standard, user, movie, photo, eco, reader, RTS, and FPS. Brightness and contrast are only adjustable when in standard, user, and reader. These presets will not be available once you enable HDR in the panel menu and in Windows, and it will just list this as being in the standard preset once you are in HDR. Black Equalizer isn't something I use much with other panels, but I do want to note that I have used it more to control white levels as the monitor can lean darker overall sometimes. After this, you have the color tab, which has color temperature, gamma, hue, saturation, blue light filter, HDMI color range, and color gamut. For color temperature, you have normal, cool, warm, and user. Hue and saturation have the primary and secondary colors that you can adjust. HDMI color range has auto, full range, in limited range, while the color gamut has sRGB, DCI P3, Display P3, and Normal. I've left all the footage in this video on Normal. Next is the Gaming Setup tab, where you have Adaptive Sync, Timer, Crosshair, FPS Counter, HDR Mode, low input lag, and RGB light. If you're not familiar with Adaptive Sync, it needs to be on in order to enable G-Sync compatibility if you have an NVIDIA GPU. HDR mode, you have two settings only here. You have Standard and Cinema. With this video, any of the gaming footage, I label the game and what HDR mode it's in, or if it's in SDR. To reiterate here, you can only adjust a black equalizer when HDR is enabled in the display tab, and in the color tab, you can only adjust the color temperature. The last tab I want to cover is the advanced settings tab, which has OLED pixel refresh, OLED expert, screensaver, USB sleep power, DP compatibility, DSC, and DDC slash CI. For OLED pixel refresher, you can turn this to auto, enable, and start at shutdown. This is a pixel cleansing like any other OLED would have, and it can take six to eight minutes. The OLED Expert is a shorter one minute pixel maintenance function that KTC says is for more accurate calibration of pixel drive voltage slash current parameters. It might be useful to run occasionally if you notice any uniformity, variations, brightness variations, or any slight signs of image retention. It explains this a little when you actually pull this up and you choose to enable this function and then it will say this takes one minute. After that you have screen saver which you can set for 5, 10, 20, or 30 minutes to help prevent static images on the screen which would eventually potentially cause burn-in. For DP compatibility you can switch this between 1.4, 1.2, and 1.1. Next, you have the Display Stream Compression, which is a compression algorithm that lets monitors and TVs display resolutions and refresh rates that they wouldn't otherwise be able to actually handle. You can turn this on or off, and here the reason would be if you wanted to actually turn HDR on with 10-bit color and then run that at 240 Hz, because if you don't enable DSC, you're actually going to be capped at 200 Hz with those settings due to the bandwidth limitations. Enabling this, most people won't notice a difference, but running the ORSTT, I had some bad results with this enabled in regards to response time, which I'm going to talk about those results after running the ORSTT here in a little bit, and I will cover 
the difference that I saw between the SDR results and then the HD results, especially when running DSC. Next though, you have the display data channel, the DDC, and then the command interface, CI. This is gonna be last here, and this is a type of communication between the computer and the monitor. It holds a collection of protocols used to facilitate the transmission of display-related information between the computer display and the display adapter. You would need an app to actually facilitate this interface here, and this then allows you to tweak and adjust things with the display. And in regards to this, I will have a link in the description if you want to read more about what you can do with this. All right, shifting now into the response time testing that I did here using the OSRTT. This is the on-screen response time tester, and this is from Tech Team GB. I will put a link for not only his channel, but also this product that he makes here. And this is a newer test for me, so part of this is I am learning more about this. But here we have perceived response time, RGB overshoot, and visual response rating. At the bottom, on the left-hand side, we are looking kind of at the best and worst here. And with that, the best response time that we had was 0.4 milliseconds. The worst was 4.2, so 4.2 seconds, right? So the advertised response time here is 0 0.03 milliseconds. We are not seeing that here. I did have some issues with RGB overshoot at 204. You can see that on that chart. I did have worse results. I was talking to Tech Team GB on his Discord, just trying to figure this out. And with the OLED panels, they just have overshoot here. So the scale that you're looking at is zero being black, 255 being pure white. So we're looking at the scale and the response time that it takes to go into these different shades, right? Looking here, I mean, re perceived response time, for the most part, we are under one millisecond, for the most part. We start to get this change when we get to 153, 204, 255. With that, that may just be due to it being an OLED panel. Going over to RGB overshoot, this is where we are seeing at 204, you get that huge increase because we really don't see much. And then all of a sudden, 153 starts creeping up and then 204, you see it shoot up. This is the best result that I did get. Testing this out in HDR, everything was worse just because I had the panel settings just so that the brightness was cranked up, shifted all of this down to get a better result here. So for me, the main takeaway here is this does have a fast response time. It is not as they have advertised at the 0 0.03 milliseconds. And we do start to see as we start getting more towards a very pure white, we start to see this response time go down and we start to see more RGB overshoot. Just keep in mind that that is something that you generally see with OLED panels. And although we are seeing this monitor struggle as we shift into a more pure white here with perceived response time and RGB overshoot and even the visual response rating here, how much of that translates to what you're seeing on screen? This is still a very fast monitor. If you're running a UFO test, you're not going to see ghosting, inverse ghosting, black trailing or anything visually with this. Again, we see this struggle a little bit when it comes to this test, but we have to take all that information and then also look at how is it running games. And I'm not really seeing much in regards to ghosting and all that. It's still fast here in terms of the response time. It just tends to struggle once we get more towards a pure white. So I did hear back from KTC. I wanted to put this here. I wanted to leave the original spec section the same because to me it's frustrating that I'm seeing so many companies have these different listings and now you have to contact the company to find out what the actual specs are in regards to their product. There's just too much, in my opinion, misinformation because this stuff is either missing or mislabeled. So covering this here and I will put this in the description still for everybody. They're labeling peak nits here, but they don't really label it. They just give me a higher number it is 450 nits at an APL of 25%, which is an average picture level. I will put a link in the description so you guys can look into that a little bit more. They're not giving me a smaller window on this though, which is usually what you see companies give you. It's like, hey, we hit a thousand nits 
and we do that in a 2% window, right? Not a 25% window. We do it in a 2% window. And with that, that's how they can get that. And then they get that certified through VESA, which they did tell me that the HDR here is VESA certified. I didn't see that anywhere on the website. Maybe I missed it, but usually companies kind of blast that in your face because they want you to know that, hey, this is certified here, but they don't have that as far as I can see. So with that, they're not giving me the smaller window. And then the next one here is kind of like typical, but if they're giving it to me with an APL of 100%. And so that is 150 nits. So if your whole screen was filled bright white, the nits is going to be 150. If you shrink that down to 25% of the monitor, so 25% of the screen in a box is white, you would have 450 nits. Again, most people with these, they'll shrink that all the way down to 2% and they'll say, hey, our peak luminance or nits here is going to be 1,000, 2,000 nits, whatever. And then they get that certified and then that's how they promote their product as having HDR 1000. But they don't have that information here with this. I did reach out to see, hey, what's the 2% window? So hopefully I hear back. Shifting over now to the color gamut for sRGB, it's 100% of the color gamut coverage, but 136% of the color gamut volume. And with that, when we're looking at color volume, you're gonna include all the hue, saturation, and brightness levels with that, that you're not typically doing when you're just looking at the color gamut coverage. Again, they don't label that on their website. Not, not a fan of the fact that they're not distinguishing those two things. And then looking at DCI P3, 97% color gamut coverage, and then 100% color gamut volume coverage here. For the color gamut volume, they do list 96% coverage for the NTSC. And then the contrast, they're saying this is 150,000 to one. So it's not the 1.5 million. Again, usually when I'm looking at OLEDs, I see that higher contrast. That's kind of one of the features everybody wants, but they're saying it's only 150,000 to one. That's still good, but I would expect more out of this panel. Again, especially considering, I mean, you get infinite black levels with these. If the pixel's not lit, it's just that infinite black level. You get a higher contrast here, but they're saying that this is from the engineer team too with this. So. That is all the corrections for the specs here, but I do want to reiterate, I've had this same issue with almost every single monitor that I've reviewed. Samsung is actually one that I've found I have that issue more frequently with actually. And a newer brand that I finally got to review one of their monitors, Alienware, I had to reach out to the company to find out some missing specs and some stuff that I wasn't quite sure was correct off of their listing for the product. That one, we're dealing with a 32 inch 4K, 240 Hertz OLED, like over double the price of this monitor. And I'm having that same issue where I need to reach out to the company, track down this information that honestly should just be there. So now moving forward, I'm not going to talk about this again. Usually I put these issues in like the gray area section, but I've already covered this now. So now shifting over to the good, the things that I like about this monitor, and I'm going to start with the price point and what you get here. If you can find this with a discount code and get it for somewhere in the $600 range, I think this is a solid deal. With this, you are getting an OLED panel here. So you're getting that really good vibrancy and picture clarity that the OLEDs offer, especially when we're looking at the infinite black levels, you're getting all of that. This thing just looks incredible in person, again, at a price that is half of some of these other ones. Now, the new ones that are coming out that are, they're larger, they're bigger, they're 4K, they maybe have higher refresh rates, all those other things in their new panel types, those obviously are going to cost a lot more, but just looking at what has been out, I am expecting that this price maybe even goes lower this year. I think we're just going to see a downward trend. You may be picking this up for under $600 here in the next couple months. So picture quality wise, this thing just looks really, really good. I like this for gaming. If you're consuming content, I like it in SDR and HDR across the board to me, it just looks good. But again, that's because you're dealing with an OLED here. That is the main draw. 
And although I've had some issues with the testing where it was showing some results that lend to the response time not being nearly as great as they advertise, in the real world, do I see any ghosting if I'm running a UFO test? No, I don't see any ghosting. I don't see any inverse ghosting. I'm not noticing any black smearing. I'm not noticing any issues in terms of picture quality with this when gaming. So you got that fast response time. I doubt it's 0 0.03 milliseconds. Again, just based off of my test, it's not even that, right? Are we looking at closer to under one millisecond? Yes, but it's not gonna be the 0 0.03 for sure. But again, how much does that translate while I'm gaming? Am I noticing anything? I'm not, I'm just noticing a very fast response time here. So to me, that's another upside. It looks great in terms of picture quality and motion clarity here. So you're not getting, like I said, the ghosting, inverse ghosting, motion blur, black trailing, anything like that, that you may find with slower VA or IPS panels. So this thing just performs very well. And that then translates also to not just the PC, but also to consoles. So just covering consoles, I think this pairs great with consoles as well. And looking at the Xbox, this is what it shows the modes that are available to you. This will with a console upscale to 4k. So here you get every single mode. The only thing you can't do on an Xbox, you don't have Dolby Vision here, which is just a form of HDR, and then you don't have 4K 120 Hertz. If you upscale, what you're gonna run into is a bandwidth limitation because this is HDMI 2.0, not 2.1. So you can't do 4K 120 Hertz, you can do 4K 60 Hertz, and that is with HDR enabled. Now, personally, if I upscale to 4K, I'm not really noticing a difference in the quality of the image. If it's there, it's very subtle. But I did test this out, and I tested the PlayStation 5 and then the Xbox Series X. Both of these perform extremely well. It just, again, not just on PC. It looks great with consoles as well. So any of the upside with an OLED, you're getting it here with the console. And then add to that, you get the really good speakers the two five watt speakers you get the inputs so the usb expansions but also the type c that not only supplies power but also can be used as a display input going back to that alienware that one actually has those same things it has those inputs right we get the usb expansion then we get the type c expansion but the usb type c can only charge a device at 20 watts this one being at 65 watts, now it can charge a handheld or a laptop and then double as a display input. So we're looking at features that this thing has that something that is over double the price does not have. The Alienware also, no speakers. It has no built-in speakers. Now they traded that out a little bit because they have eARC on the HDMI so you can connect a sound bar to that and actually get like sound through the hdmi cable to that but i'm not going to use a sound bar with a pc monitor so they did some trade out stuff that was a little bit more unique but features that i'm seeing with this that i'm not seeing on these other ones does strike me as a little bit odd because I like the features that they have here. I like when a monitor has the option for speakers. I like the KVM switch. I like when we have a USB type C input that not only delivers a higher amount of power so you can charge these larger devices, but again, you can use it as a display input as well. So just to recap, we have a solid price point. You get an OLED. It looks incredible. You get the fast response time that visually it's going to be fast, even though again, some of the tests weren't quite what we wanted to see. HDR here is solid. You pair that with consoles. It looks really, really good. And then you get all these other little extras again that some of these more expensive OLED monitors don't have. Really, really good speakers. We get the KVM switch. We get the type C input that delivers high power and can be used as the display input. So in terms of the good here, it has a lot going for it. Shifting over to the bad here, they don't have a warranty at least listed on their website for coverage of OLED burn-in on this that I can find for this specific model. Now for their other OLEDs, what I'm seeing is 12 months for the panel. So you get a year. 
I also don't know what that process is like. When I reviewed the other KTC monitor, I said the same thing. I think that's something that may deter people from buying this. This being a brand that has been making these other panels for other companies, that's great. But when it comes to, hey, I need to send it back to you specifically, and they are in China, what is that process like? I don't find any information on that on their website. So here, I like that it has the warranty that, yeah, we're most likely going to be getting 12 months. I don't like that it's not listed, but I'm just kind of basing that off of all of their other OLEDs have that. To me, this is just, again, more missing information off of their website. I do wish it was longer when we're looking at Samsung or Alienware and they're getting like you get two, three years with that. I would prefer that. But if you're looking at the newer MSI, one of the things there that is a draw for people that's coming out this year, 32 inch 4K, 240 hertz. It has a cheaper price point than a lot of other OLEDs. One of the reasons why is there is no warranty. If there is any burn in, any issues, you are not covered. I'm assuming they probably have like a 30 day, right? If they're, if it shows up and it's broken, yeah, they're probably going to replace it. But outside of that, you are kind of on your own here. Assuming that we get the 12 months, that is better than nothing. I wish it was longer and I don't know what the process is like to send it to them for repairs. Where am I sending it? Do I have to pay for it? How long do they have it? How long till I get it back? Because if I'm shipping it to China, I mean, that's going to take a long time. At that point, I can't be without a monitor for like six months while they repair it. That's crazy to me, but we don't have that information. So again, I think that is going to deter a lot of people from buying KTC monitors. Now, Outside of that, the only other thing, it has nothing to do with the actual panel itself. It's the stand in the cable management clip. This is actually a stand I've seen on other monitor brands. I reviewed a Scepter monitor that had this exact stand. There's, uh, I think it's Innocent. They have one that has this exact stand. I wanna say, AOC has one and then there's another company. So it's just like this common stand that is cheaper that you see on a lot of other monitors that are not the major brands like MSI and Samsung and things like that. They're these to me like secondary brands. It's just to me, it's more flimsy. I don't like the aesthetics of it. And then the cable management clip here, it's like it's, it's usable, it's just not really good at all. You can't fit much in it. And considering how many ports this has on it, there should have been a better option here because you're not gonna be able to actually utilize all of those and then run it through the cable management clip. It just can't handle that many cables going into it. So uh, design here, yeah, I just wish it was better. The RGB lighting on the back, it's kind of take it or leave it. Uh, it's cool that it's there. The more I've reviewed monitors, the more I realize like, once you set up the monitor, you're never even going to realize that there's lighting on the back of it unless it's just massive. Most of the time, I'd say like 99% of the time, you're never even going to notice it or you're just gonna forget and maybe down the road, you realize that the lighting is even there. So that is it for the bad here. Shifting over now to the gray area. These are things you may or may not care about. Now, the good news is I only have one thing here. Part of that is because of the price point and the features that this has, because I, again, I have to judge it based off of that. And with this, to me, it's the settings. You have a good amount of options. It's not gonna be nearly as good as what you find with higher end OLED monitors but compared to some, it may be very similar. The things I would like to see here is just a little bit more control in certain areas. One of those being HDR. You get the two preset options, that's really it. Some of the other monitors you're looking, they can have up to six. So with those as well, you may even have like a, a custom HDR where you get to adjust some of the stuff with that. You can adjust the saturation or the hue or the contrast here more basic, it doesn't have that. And I was going back and forth on whether or not to even include this because again of the price point, I'm not saying it should have as many options as those high end monitors, but I would still, I would have liked to have seen more out of this, just a little bit, a little bit more control specifically out of HDR. SDR, you still get a good amount of control, but specifically HDR, 
a little bit more control would have been helpful. Now, if you do the command interface, if you go through and adjust this through the DDC, the CI, and you have the program, yes, it gives you that secondary level of control. I don't know how many people are actually going to go down that route though. If you utilize that, yes, you can go in and start to adjust some of those things, but it's also a lot more work to get it there. I prefer simple. So if it was in the panel, you just gave me a couple more options. I think it would have been a nicer touch here. And again, I think you're going to have people that are like, I'm fine with it. I don't really care. And you're going to have some people that are going to go. I wish I had more control over this. And in that camp, you're going to have people that are like, I'm not going to try to do the command interface. I'm not going to download the DDC. I'm not going to start doing that. And you're going to have the other ones who are like, yeah, I'll just go ahead and do that. I've done that before. It's easy. I already know how to do it because if you don't know how to do it, it may feel overwhelming in this. If you have color calibration tools and things like that, specifically for OLED, you may go down that route. Typically what I find though, is if you have all of that stuff, you're in that deep, usually a monitor like this may not even be on your radar, which is why I put this in the gray area. So that is it for the gray area, just that one thing, maybe down the road, we get some update to the firmware where they do have those adjustments, who knows, but we may also see some new products coming from KTC sometime this year. I didn't see anything that they debuted at CES. They were there. I didn't see any new stuff though, but who knows, maybe they're keeping it in hiding for right now. One last thing I did want to cover actually is text fringing here. I don't know the subpixel layout. My assumption is it is RGB, but I couldn't find any information on this. Here, it being 1440p at the 27 inches, you're looking at a PPI of roughly 110. So it has a good pixel density. It's not going to obviously beat out 4K. When you're looking at OLEDs and the RGB subpixel layout, you just ultimately have text fringing to some degree. It is here. It's not horribly noticeable. You could run clear type to improve that, but it is there. So I feel with this, we're going to have people that really notice it and you're going to have some people that don't notice at all. I think it just depends on your eyes here, but I just wanted to let everybody know going into this that you may have that it may be noticeable for you. So that is going to wrap this video up for the downside this may have for the missing specs for some results with the response time that aren't ideal. This is still to me an incredible monitor because of what it's offering at that price point being $600 in that $600 range for an OLED with these specs, 1440p. 240 hertz, 27 inches, that's going to be extremely hard to come by. And again, I expect that this price over the next handful of months is most likely going to come down even further. You may find this and it could be in the $500 price range if they have a good coupon for it. So just keep looking out for that. I will have a link for this in the description if you want to pick it up. If you have any questions about this monitor, let me know in the comment section. I will make sure to answer that for you there. And that's going to wrap this one up. If you like the video, hit the like button for me as it helps the channel out. If you want to continue to follow along with all my content, hit the subscribe button for me. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.